On October 22, 2025, Ukraine launched one of its largest guided missile strikes since the war began. A HIMARS crew prepared to fire one of the most powerful and advanced American missile, GMLRS. But just as they locked onto a massive Russian fuel refinery in occupied Crimea, a counter-battery radar exposed their position. Within minutes, interceptor rockets screamed toward them, while Russia's most advanced air defenses alerted everyone within 400 kilometers. Missiles raced against time, GPS jamming, and tons of steel. You're about to witness Ukraine's biggest strike on Russian territory. But will it succeed, or will interceptors kill the strike before impact? At exactly 6.45 a.m. on October 22, 2025, a three-man HIMARS crew heard the order they had rehearsed for months. Batteries, release, in seconds, one of the most advanced rocket artillery systems on the planet would strike a key Russian energy installation, turning an otherwise ordinary morning into a case study in precision warfare. The launcher had been in place for less than four minutes. Their M142 platform, set on a six-wheeled tactical truck weighing 16 tons, stood anchored as hydraulic arms bit into the earth. The driver kept the engine alive, knowing that in under five minutes they would have to break contact and vanish before counter-battery fire could close in. Inside the cabin, the section leader leaned over the glowing universal fire control system, confirming the last parameters. This digital brain fused satellite coordinates with atmospheric readings, ballistic equations, and encrypted target data streaming down secure links. The solution was already locked. Launch vectors, time of flight, and impact sequence plotted for the two rockets waiting in the pod. Each GMLRS round, sealed in its tube with a 90 kilogram warhead, was engineered to tear through reinforced structures, but they were far from ordinary munitions. With both GPS guidance and inertial navigation on board, the rockets could make mid-course corrections, ensuring that even at maximum reach, they would land within 15 meters of the aim point. For all its sophistication, the launcher was built for simplicity. A system packed with some of the most advanced guidance electronics ever fielded could still be fired with a single press of a switch. Every detail, ballistic arc, launch timing, synchronized impact, was handled by the onboard AI computer. Both rockets were already programmed to travel on separate paths, yet converge on the same target at the same instant. At 6.46, the gunner's thumb came down. The first missile tore free of the pod in a thunderclap, 10,000 pounds of thrust hammering into the blast deflector and shaking the truck back on its frame. In seconds, the rocket was a streak at over 2,300 miles per hour. 15 seconds later, the second round launched. Its delay calculated to split defenses and mask the true approach. Different vectors, different arcs, but both locked on the Feodosia oil refinery in Crimea, time to arrive within a heartbeat of each other. The crew was already in motion as the rockets arced out of sight. The driver dropped the truck into gear while the hydraulic arms folded back into their housings. 90 seconds. That was all they needed to vanish down the dirt track, leaving only scorched fumes and the imprint of tires in the clay. Behind them, the Feodosia oil refinery remained unaware of the strike that was seconds away. Far overhead, two GMLRS rounds were running one of the most advanced guidance routines ever built. At more than 2,300 miles per hour, each missile corrected itself dozens of times every second, adjusting tiny control surfaces to stay locked on course. The first round had climbed above 45,000 feet before tipping over into its descent. At that altitude, its GPS receiver drank in satellite signals without interference, cross-checking coordinates against its programmed aim point and refining its trajectory toward the facility below. GPS alone could not guarantee the level of accuracy demanded. That was why each missile carried its own inertial navigation package in the nose, an array of accelerometers and gyroscopes constantly recording every shift in speed and heading. This inertial unit, the IMU, gave the rockets a self-contained sense of motion that no electronic warfare system could disrupt. Even if Russian operators managed to interfere with satellite signals, the missiles would stay on course. With GPS updates layered on top of inertial data, the guidance loop was redundant, resilient, and lethal, ensuring that the target would be hit regardless of jamming attempts. The trajectories had been plotted with precision to reduce any chance of interception. Instead of driving straight toward the aim point, both missiles flew low, skimming along massed routes that kept them hidden from radar until the last possible moment. The first round angled in from the northwest, the second from the northeast. Separate bearings meant to saturate whatever defenses ringed the gas plant, 
As they dropped through the final stretch, their descent rate topped 60,000 feet per minute. The distance to the target collapsed in seconds. On paper, Russian air defenses could engage, but theory and reality were far apart. Against hypersonic closure speeds, minimal radar signature, and smart terminal guidance, the odds of a clean intercept were close to zero. Inside each missile racing toward the Theodosia fuel terminal lay 200 pounds of high explosive, packed in a configuration meant for far more than blast and fragments. These were shaped charge penetrators, designed to shear through reinforced structures as if they were fragile shells. The explosive itself, PBXN-109, detonates at nearly 26,000 feet per second. But chemistry alone isn't the secret. The real power comes from the way that detonation is directed, focused, and transformed into a cutting jet. But the GMLRS warhead was more than a shaped charge spear. Wrapped around the core sat a fragmentation sleeve packed with over 180,000 steel pellets, each one preformed and ready to shred anything within 15 meters of the blast. Against a facility like Theodosia, planners would almost certainly choose a delayed detonation, allowing the warhead to burrow deep before going off. Half a second might not sound like much, but in that sliver of time, the missile could drive well inside the structure, turning the explosion into an internal kill. At 6.46 a.m., Russian air defense operators finally saw the threat. The 64th Air Defense Regiment, tasked with shielding key sites across the Crimea region, had less than 45 seconds to react. Two GMLR's rounds were closing in at more than 2,300 miles per hour, a speed that left almost no margin for human decision-making. What followed would illustrate exactly why even the most advanced defensive systems struggle against modern precision strike weapons. The first blip appeared on an S-400 early warning array positioned 15 kilometers southeast of Theodosia oil refinery. Its vast dish, capable of detecting aircraft hundreds of kilometers away, now registered two tiny, needle-fast returns, streaking in from Ukrainian-held territory. The data lit up the screens, but the question was whether the system could do more than simply watch them arrive. Detecting the rockets was one thing, holding a reliable track was another. Each GMLRS round had been engineered to appear almost invisible on radar, presenting a return no bigger than a large bird. Flying low and fast, they flickered in and out of the S-400 scope, the computer struggling to reacquire every time the missiles adjusted course during their terminal phase. 30 seconds from impact, the Russian battery tried to respond. Two 48N6 interceptors launched in tandem, their exhaust plumes tearing into the sky. Each carried a fragmentation warhead of nearly 150 pounds, programmed to shred incoming threats with proximity bursts. On paper, these interceptors were formidable. Mach 6 speeds, advanced seekers, the ability to engage multiple tracks. But theory met reality too late. The S-400 needed a full minute to build an accurate firing solution against weapons moving this fast. They had been given only 45 seconds. The interceptors were still accelerating when the incoming rockets broke into their final dive, executing tiny course corrections every fraction of a second. The fire control computers could not predict the weaving flight path with enough precision to score a hit. The two defensive missiles streaked close, within 200 meters, but at hypervelocity, that distance may as well have been miles. Then came the saturation. The rockets were not just fast. They were attacking from different bearings at the same time, forcing the defense grid to split its attention. Overload was inevitable. With 20 seconds left, desperation set in. The battery commander ordered the close-in weapons to fire. Two Panzer S-1 vehicles opened up, their twin 30mm cannons spewing 5,000 rounds a minute. Streams of high-explosive shells clawed at the air, but the geometry was hopeless. At 2,300 miles per hour, the rockets were covering a kilometer every second. The tracers stitched empty sky as the targets plunged past. The last line of defense had failed. At 6.47 local time, the first HIMARS round slammed into the Theodosia main processing unit. Moving at more than 2,000 miles per hour, the 200-pound warhead punched through the reinforced concrete facade as if it were paper. A shaped charged jet cut straight into the pressurized machinery and then detonated. The explosion blossomed inside the core of the facility, where massive compressors kept natural gas at 75 times atmospheric pressure. The blast wave, expanding at 26,000 feet per second, shredded pipework and tore apart the containment systems designed to hold back thousands of cubic meters of fuel. In an instant, high-pressure gas began venting into the structure at catastrophic speed, flooding the interior with an invisible tide. 
but the strike was only half complete. 15 seconds after the initial blast, the second HIMARS round slammed into the facility's central control building. This warhead, set for a delayed fuse, punched through the exterior walls before erupting inside the supervisory control and data acquisition room. In an instant, the computers that might have triggered emergency shutdowns were obliterated. The staggered timing was deliberate. Military planners had modeled the gap between impacts to amplify the devastation. The first rocket had ripped open the processing unit, flooding the site with volatile gas. The second removed any chance of containing what was about to follow, erasing the only systems capable of fighting the firestorm as it took hold. The physics that followed were merciless. Natural gas venting from the shattered compressors mixed with oxygen in the open air, creating the textbook recipe for a fuel air blast of immense scale. Within 45 seconds of the first strike, the ratio of gas to atmosphere had reached the perfect point of combustion, saturating the fractured buildings and rolling out across the entire complex. Ignition was inevitable. Sparks from severed power lines and smashed control panels lit the volatile cloud. What followed was not simple fire, but detonation, flame fronts racing at supersonic velocity, shockwaves tearing outward and shattering glass kilometers away. A towering fireball rose into the morning sky, hundreds of feet high, fed by the plant's entire reserve of natural gas. The violence carried far beyond the site. Seismic sensors more than 100 kilometers distant recorded the blast as a 2.1 magnitude, equal to the simultaneous detonation of 50 tons of TNT. For miles around, the explosion was both seen and felt, an industrial inferno unleashed in seconds. In the first 60 seconds after impact, the inferno burned at over 1,800 degrees Celsius, hot enough to liquefy steel and grind concrete into dust. One by one, the underground storage tanks gave way, each rupture feeding fresh fuel into the blaze and driving the flames higher. Two precision-guided rockets, together weighing less than 700 pounds, had erased a facility that embodied decades of construction and tens of millions in investment. In under five minutes, an industrial complex had been reduced to rubble and twisted metal. The Feodosia gas plant would never process another cubic meter of natural gas again. Thank you for watching. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe for more frontline stories every week.